Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben Rufili from the Health Systems Governance Collaborative Secretariat, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar session on moving towards adaptive complex systems. This is the fifth webinar session in our Building the Reset series, uh, and we are very happy that you could all join us, even if it's, uh, some of you are already on uh, summer holidays. Um, so today we have an ama amazing panel and we really and I really look forward to the discussion we'll be having. Uh, if you missed the, the previous webinars, we will put the, the links into the chat box so you can play catch up and, and see what you may have missed. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Goldlieb Van Heteren, who's going to be your moderator today. Thank you, Goldlieb. Thanks, Ben, uh, and welcome everybody around the world. Uh, we already saw some signs of people uh, greeting us from Bangladesh, of people greeting us from East and West, so we're, we're extremely happy uh, that we continue our conversation, which by now has become quite an exciting conversation on building the reset. Um, I try to, to avoid a lot of uh, COVID talk these days because uh, too many people are talking too much about COVID already, but of course we all know that uh, the pandemic has, uh, has uh, challenged us all uh, and on pretty fundamental levels. So this Building the Reset is an initiative of, uh, of four uh, global networks and a lot of participants and, and symp sympathizers who uh, are all keen to, to join uh, a serious and fundamental conversation about what next. Um, and that what next is not based on zero. Basically, a lot of things have already happened. So as we saw over the last uh, couple of weeks in the webinar series, we've had conversations about planetary health, which is a very exciting emerging field of interaction between all kinds of people who feel that this is the time maybe to change and reset more fundamentally. Uh, we've had a webinar on common goods for health as the new ground zero for, for health. Um, because we all feel that what this COVID has taught us is that there, there are things that have been neglected and maybe neglected for too long. Um, we've had a, a webinar on equity and agency and turning the tables, because again, uh, as, as this pandemic demonstrates painfully, uh, there have been inequities in the health system and also in the world uh, more generally that um, affect the same people over and over again. So we felt the time has now come maybe to, to move to spaces where we can finally address these fundamental inequities and, and levels of agency uh, and have new voices at the table uh, because we do not want to, to tackle this crisis with the same uh, thoughts and same practices that actually caused the crisis. So there's been a lot of very positive energy in the series so far. Um, there have been people very loyal to the series and, and like Benjamin said, everything will be online for you to revisit so we hope that people do that um, and in the coming days we will put out some blogs to summarize what has been the harvest so far uh, we're, we're going to take a short break uh, uh, on this webinar series but not a break on our work because we feel that now is the time to actually act and engage um, so we will keep you posted uh, in the coming weeks as well now to our webinar of today um, this is, uh, is one that will also pull, I think, quite a number of things together because uh, many countries have realized in fighting the current pandemic that um, a, lot of, a lot of our institutions, a lot of our practices are not adaptive enough uh, to what we now face. And uh, the people who have attended earlier webinars remember maybe had the, the tidal waves that uh, David Ubura, one of our previous speakers, put on the slide. And it, it's, it's sort of a... a it starts with a virus and it ends up with a global, very fundamental revisiting of our institutions and of our, our practices. And that is the course of this webinar as well. We, we will talk about adaptive health systems. Uh, Hala, who I see is also joining us today, uh, in the last webinar she actually posed the question, in, can we please get our own house in order? Now, for many people, our own house is maybe something else, but let's say for people working in health, uh, our own health systems, I think they, they have a lot also to answer for and, and to, to rethink. Um, and that is what this webinar will, uh, will try to address. Now, there are many dimensions to this question, and therefore we're very happy that we have uh, four fantastic kickoff speakers. It is like last time, we try to uh, have everybody reflect on one question, and the question here is adaptive health systems, what, how? now uh, and that question will be approached from four different angles 
and I'm, I'm hugely, hugely happy that we have these kickoffs because they promised me that they would actually uh, take five minutes each and we'll try to uh, keep time for, for a real conversation with everybody present. So welcome to you all. And I, uh, I will first uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, which is uh, Professor Manuel Dairit. Uh, he is not unknown to the governance arena because uh, he was the former Minister of Health in the Philippines um, and was actually acting minister during the time of the SARS crisis back in 2003. Uh, he's also one of the leading epidemiologists in the country and so he's, he's a person with you know, seasoned experience around crises. Um, he led the Department of Health during that, uh, that pandemic but he's also been very active currently in, uh, in the COVID-19 control efforts and he leads a public-private task force that undertakes zero prevalence uh, surveys in local communities. Uh, Dr. Dairit was also the director or, from 2005 to 2012 of the Department of Human Resources for Health at the WHO in Geneva. And from 2013 till very recently, last year, he was the Dean of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health uh, in, uh, in Manila, where he's still acting as an as a adjunct professor. So a very, very seasoned, uh, seasoned colleague, and we're extremely happy that he will uh, kick this discussion off uh, from where he currently stands in the middle of, uh, of the COVID crisis in the Philippines, but from a long-standing experience of thinking about systems. So Dr. Dairit, adaptive health systems, what does that mean to you? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Koji. And um, hello to everyone, dear friends everywhere in the world. Well, I actually feel a sense of solidarity with all of you because wherever each one of us may be anywhere in the world at this moment, we are all kept in check by SARS-CoV-2. It is a virus. 70% or 70 times smaller than a red blood cell. And because of it, we have to change our behavior. We protect ourselves and our loved ones from a nanoparticle which causes serious illness and death. Gottlieb asked me to speak briefly on what, how and now of adaptiveness of complex health systems. Let me start by asking, what adaptations did the health systems do to address the current threat of COVID-19? And what results were achieved? The virus was brought under control swiftly and effectively. Containment measures were put into effect very early. Testing was ramped up quickly. Laboratories were mobilized in large scale. Testing protocols were put in place adeptly. Infectives were isolated efficiently. Even mobile phone apps were used creatively to track infection. New facilities were repurposed to add critical care beds and quarantine facilities. You probably agree with me that many systems were slow to respond. I was very frustrated in my own country. There were various reasons. Alarms were raised too late. Containment measures took a while to organize. Ramp off of testing was slow. Personal protective equipment for health workers and ventilators in hospitals took time to procure. The delays, even if only for a few days, had devastating effects. Cases multiplied, deaths increased. But we also saw bright spots. The rapid development of a vaccine has been unprecedented. New treatments and diagnostics have emerged, and many countries have actually controlled the spread of the virus. We must learn from this experience. Let us use the crisis to redesign and rebuild our health systems. Even as we fight the present pandemic, we must look to the future. We must aim to adapt. Let us plan our health investment and build forward better than status quo. This is what we must do. How should we proceed? Use the crisis to build a collective consciousness and awareness in society of what we must do. This collective awareness must be nurtured 
by leadership and governance that inspires trust and confidence. The vision has to be sustained over time in order to overcome past dependency and the resistance to change. It is said that resistance to change often comes from short-sighted decisions, complacency, and fear of new frontiers. But COVID-19 should convince us that failure to adapt makes us vulnerable to even more human tragedy. We should prevent future havoc that claims lives, sinks economies, and causes incalculable human suffering. Finally, let us seize the now. Let us use the present crisis to break down constricting silos, obsolete molds, and we worn out habits. The whole of government approach only works. Bureaucracies of government reinvent new ways to communicate, plan, and implement together. The whole of society approach means that governments meaningfully should engage with multiple stakeholders in society, including the private sector, and especially the people to defeat COVID-19. Ultimately, defeating COVID-19 calls for social cohesion in societies and in the world that this generation has never seen before. So to summarize and conclude, the what? Seize the opportunity to build forward better. The how? Build a collective awareness catalyzed by leadership and governance that inspires trust and confidence. And the now strengthens social cohesion towards whole of society response in our respective countries and in the world. Thank you. Th thanks a lot, Dr. Dairit. Uh, I think some beautiful key concepts and notions. Uh, first of all, I think we, we probably all agree with you that the, the, the seize the now, that is um, we cannot be complacent. This is no time for complacency. Um, so definitely, yes. Inspiring leadership. Um, I think we could fill probably a whole afternoon talking about that, what that constitutes and where we find it and where we don't find it at the moment. But I think it's, it's vital as we will probably will all agree and we will address later. Um, and then building social cohesion. Um, I think that is a task that again, we will also visit in this conversation later uh, because it is extremely important that cohesion instead of polarization and fragmentation uh, is now taking place. And that is hard work as we all, uh, as we all can envisage. So let's, let's try to revisit these, uh, these vital opening themes um, in the conversation later. Uh, but I first like to give the floor to our next speaker with thanks of course to Dr. Dairit, um, to Dr. Jean Benoit Falis who um, is actually on holiday. We grabbed him from his holiday resort, but he, he looks happy, so he's probably had a good night's sleep. Um, he is a lecturer at the Center of African Studies at the University of Edinburgh, and a fellow there uh, at the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Jean Benoit has been working on health governance and social accountability in health since 2009, uh, both in the world of NGOs and in international organizations and as an academic researcher. His work has included a lot of different methods, interdisciplinary mixed methods research on health financing, health facility committees, and on how people use the label indigent, and all in the African Great Lakes uh, region, so DRC and Burundi. Jean Benoit's approach spans across various social science disciplines, reflecting his academic background in development economics, in history, in philosophy, and political science, a very nice mix. Uh, he is currently, and this is one of the main reasons also why we uh, are very happy to, uh, to have him here, uh, the initiator and lead researcher of the COVID-19 Response Governance Mapping Initiative, um, and a link to that initiative will uh, appear shortly in the, in the chat box. Um, that's a collaborative project that documents the ways in which the COVID-19 response actually plays out. 
uh, and is being decided and organized around the world. And from that perspective, he will talk about our key question, adaptive systems, Jean Benoit, what, how, now? Over to you. Thank you very much, I believe. I'm really humbled to be, to be here today, very humbled to, uh, to speak after uh, Professor Derrick as well. Um, so, adaptive complex health systems research is probably a good way to qualify what we're doing in the COVID-19 governance pilot research project. Together with colleagues from four universities and contributors from uh, collectivity, we try to characterize the evolving relationships between actors in the COVID-19 response. We mostly look at the national level, who does what, through which institutional arrangements, and in which contexts. So, so far, we've had contributions on and from about 20 countries, mostly African countries, and we're still busy getting back to uh, contributors and, and uh, developing analysis. So thank you very much if you want of uh, the contributors, uh, by the way, we will, we will get back to you very shortly. Uh, today, I, I want to share with you uh, three provocations, really, uh, and this provocation is sort of gradually emerging from the uh, data we are uh, looking at. First, um, health systems adaptivity often looks like a takeover if we consider the top level governance that is embedded by COVID-19 task forces. Second, looking at subsystems of the health systems and in particular gender mainstreaming, adaptivity may also mean sidelining some actors. Third, health systems adaptivity also means that actors change position in the system and civil society and private actors often seem pushed to a service provision role only. So let me go back to the first, the first point. Um, and before I delve into each, actually, I should add that I will not take any normative position. I don't know what is good and what is bad. I'm mostly reporting what we seem to see from the data we are getting. Um, firstly, I would like to question the extent to which health systems are indeed adapting to respond to the threat of COVID-19. Of course, in terms of healthcare delivery, we have seen many practical adaptations ranging from new systems of emergency hospitals to new protocols for caring for non COVID-19 patients in COVID times. In terms of governance though, what we seem to be seeing um, across countries really is a similar pattern. COVID-19 task forces are set up at the highest possible level of government and in some rare cases, uh, existing security councils have uh, taken the lead. Health systems representatives are included in such bodies, but they're not always the ones the driving seat, and they typically do not organize or appoint the members of the task, the, uh, task force. The adaptivity we seem um, to see is, is a form of takeover, if you want, of the top level of health systems governance by actors previously not central to it. We find the ministry in charge of the economy in almost all cases, but we also find more curious cases. For instance, the Ministry of Defense in Lebanon, uh, intelligence services in Kenya, or representatives of the Chinese embassy in Bolivia. On the one hand, this shows that COVID-19 is, is seen as important and may in fact constitute an opportunity for broadening the coalition for good health. This is the idea of the, the, the whole of government, this idea of the whole of uh, society. On the other hand, and this is slightly more worrying, I believe, it's also showing that the governance of health systems, the way the different actors make collective decisions at the top level is seen as inefficient. We have, for instance, a few cases where the military is effectively in charge of the COVID-19 response, not because the country is under military rule, but because health systems are seen as adapting too slowly and the military is seen as doing a better job. Second, I would like us to think about the parts of our complex health systems, the subsystems, that may not adapt or at a risk of disappearing. There is mounting concern concern that responses to, con to COVID-19 have um, often been insensitive to the situation of disadvantaged groups, um, including women. There was actually uh, uh, a full webinar about that. Uh, what we find in our data, and the more we look at it, the clearer it becomes, is that the governance of the COVID-19 response is, offer a is often a failure of the mainstreaming approach. So let me stick to the case of gender here. The idea of gender mainstreaming is to prevent uh, measures and policies from being default male by systematically checking and integrating gender concerns. This is typically done 
via specialized units and consultations with civil society. Now, in the response to COVID-19, we found that such mechanisms often break apart. In all the countries that we've mapped, there is no consultation with uh, civil society. In the Ministry of Gender or specialized gender units uh, in the Ministry of Health are not consulted. As the COVID-19 crisis drags on, emergency is less and less of an excuse for such oversight. The real risk here is that adaptivity is at the expense of the weakest actors. Of course, there's another way to look at it. Too, gender mainstreaming was a strategy fraught with problems and is a chance to reinvent it. This is probably what we should pay attention to. Which will be the new terms of engagement between, for instance, women's rights organizations and health systems? It's too early to say, but in countries like Kenya, what we can already see is the formation of a larger than national coalition to try to put gender back on the agenda. Third, and finally, um, we were surprised to find that non-state actors did not come up strongly in our mapping. It might be an issue with our approach, but in the limited data that we have, the private sector and civil society are cited as providing or offering services. For instance, telecom companies providing contact tracing apps. Uh, but they're not cited as being part of the governance, part of the decision-making process. Of course, we need to understand better what was in place pre-pandemic. Uh, was there actually something like a joint committees that were functional or, 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 or working lobbying processes? Uh, and we have to understand whether what we see is a real change. So I will stop here and I hope that you will disagree with, with some of what I just said, because obviously each country will have um, a situation of their, of their own. The key question really is the extent to which the mutation that is operated with the COVID-19 crisis is only transient, or is it what adaptive complex systems people would call a phase transition leading to new default roles for the different actors? Great. Um, Jean-Benoit, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I think your last question actually encapsulates uh, your whole intervention uh, because what kind of adaptivity are we seeing? What kind of movements and mutations are we actually observing in practice? Uh, and your research does quite a lot in trying to get uh, to the deeper levels of what countries and what uh, societies are currently doing. Uh, but what do we really see there? Do we see um, a grabbing? Do we see certain people or forces take over, uh, but, but at the expense of others, do we see the failures and flaws that might be pre-existing to, to COVID that now play out uh, in, in, in uh, also subnational at subnational levels and in certain groups of people? So um, is adaptivity just reconfiguring to new power relations where a lot of people are excluded? Uh, I think these are very fundamental questions. So adaptivity as such, uh, we still have to ask a deeper question is towards what do we want to adapt uh, there? I think we link to what uh, Dr. Dyrit was already also trying to open up. What, what kind of substantive change do we want to, to see forward? And that I think we will address uh, further uh, if we go further along uh, the various uh, inputs. Now, the next speaker that will contribute to that, I'm sure, uh, is Prashant. Uh, Prashant uh, Srinivas, who uh, is actually addressing, will be addressing us from, I find this so exciting, from the Tiger Resort, uh, it's, the, it's called, let me find the title, the title reserve, Tiger Reserve in southern India. Now he sent me a photo for the advertisement and I was so jealous. I thought this must be a paradisical kind of space and place. But Prashant is a, is a medical doctor. He has a wide ranging experience in working in primary care in southern India. He obtained a Master's of Public Health back in, uh, in, uh, in Antwerp in 2007-2008 and then a PhD at the University of Louvain, also in Belgium. Uh, he leads the Health Equity Cluster at the Institute of Public Health in Bangalore in India with a deep commitment to studying social determinants of health um, and health inequities across various axes of inequities uh, in his uh, home country, India. Since 2014, Prashant uh, lives in this, uh, in this tiger resort, which I would love to visit. Uh, and he works at a public health research field uh, station there. Um, so I think a very interesting site from which to, uh, to comment. Um, through a fellowship from the, the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, Prashant has set up a lot of collaborations to examine health inequities in, in indigenous communities 
in remote forested locations in southern, central, and south, uh, northeast uh, India. Uh, and he's also somebody that uh, we know very well from a lot of very uh, active engagement in, in research innovation uh, through participatory action research to implementation research. He's part of research consortia on health system strengthening, notably focusing on one health and mental health inside the primary healthcare sphere. Uh, and he is very active, uh, as we all know, in promoting more sudden low middle income country leadership in global health and global health research. So. From that rich background, uh, Prashant, it's over to you. Same question, adaptive health systems, what does that uh, evoke in your mind? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Gurliv, and uh, thank you uh, to Job Anwar and uh, Dr. Dairit. Um, I don't think I have uh, um, answers, uh, so I don't expect that uh, uh, we were looking for uh, specific answers to this question, but I have a few thoughts uh, coming from my own position uh, where I am. Yes, it is a, a, a paradise of sorts, but um, as you know, um, there's no paradise that is uh, um, saved from this pandemic. Um, the location I am at is uh, more or less at the margins, geographical margins of uh, our uh, society here in terms of its remoteness, and yet um, we've already started reporting cases, so the pandemic certainly will go everywhere, wherever people are. Um, so I think I, I, I offer um, about three or four key um, thoughts uh, coming from my um, experience. Uh, one is I think uh, very clearly the experiences uh, of those uh, who are infected or affected uh, either within, uh, even within the same household seem to be so different uh, in this pandemic. And, so uh, I think a part of adaptiveness has to be able to respond to the diversity of uh, even micro contexts that uh, this pandemic is uh, sort of opening up. Um, and we are already talking of in many countries uh, where there were already access issues uh, before the pandemic hit. So um, this crisis response of immediately ramping up testing is expected to respond to centuries old problems. Um, so I think we, I, I personally feel we put too much responsibility on the crisis response. And I don't think crisis response is uh, going to be able to uh, do what we were not able to achieve for decades to uh, centuries before. And the second one, uh, just take my own example here. Um, if, if, if any of us from this village have to go for uh, testing, we have to travel 30 kilometers um, in a, a scenario where for example, uh, public transport uh, is something that uh, is not uh, allowed to operate. So that already poses a, a design flaw in terms of how do we reach uh, many communities. Yeah, And um, that's, that's one idea, the idea of pre-existing uh, 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 difficulties. The second one, I think, is uncertainties. And, and I think it, it, there's a paradox here because when we say experts, everyone wants to rely on experts. Even there's so much talk of public health experts. There are they. In, in some countries, we are literally looking for public health experts and have them on task forces and committees, etc. Now, the what what does expertise offer in? Prashant, in Prashant, can I intervene? There's a few people uh, from other parts of the globe who say you should maybe speak a little closer to the mic uh, and a bit louder because ah. I can hear you loud and clear, but there's people oh. that uh, so. Sure. Uh, is it, is it now? I'll try to speak up. I, I hope it's better. Um, so uh, I was just saying that the second idea uh, that comes to mind on adaptive health system is the idea that an expert will somehow deliver um, adaptiveness. And I, 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 I just feel that it will not come from experts. Um, it's not going to come from experts. I think what experts have to offer here is leadership. And unfortunately, I think we seem to be looking to experts for knowledge. Um, as if, um, there's going to be a, a protocol, uh, this one new um, uh, thing that an expert will sit on a committee and he or she will give the committee and then they've cracked the situation. So I think looking to experts for knowledge seems to be another problematic thing that, uh, that, that even the political establishment seems to be succumbing to. Um, so, uh, that's the second adaptiveness. Um, 
and the third one is i think um, there's there's been quite uh, uh, there's i think uh, been a paper i forget whether it's in the indian journal of medical ethics or in some other ethics journal on the on the military metaphors uh, that 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 uh, seem to surround um, so there's there's the war room for covid then there's uh, there's there's all this attack uh, we have to attack so i think we need to also move from um, from control to care and somehow even even finding a better language um, will will help us become much more adaptive if we are we see we are continuously in the control framework uh, and we need to move to a care framework which allows us then to adapt to very different needs that we see um, around us and finally and i think this is the most uh, difficult thing being at uh, being at a really what i see is uh, the need for a multi level um, kind of a coordination when we talk of governance um, we are not talking uh, of course of uh, uh, a central government or a state government or a regional government only we are talking of a variety of actors outside of governments as well and i am afraid that um, in in contexts that were already facing difficulty with decentralizing um the ability to uh, be become adaptive is even more problematic so um, i mean these are the four uh, confusions I, i i deal with i i i hope i have not um, tangled the web more than it already is but uh, these are the four ideas i thought uh, i'll offer uh, as a conversation starter absolutely clear and and fantastic uh, interventions prashant because i think all these points you make are are, are hugely important uh, the, the the issue of dealing with diversities of micro micro contexts um that be, there's not one size fit all kind of discussion about any of this uh, like like your examples uh, clearly illustrate uh, that we have to move from crisis response modes with uh, uh joint sort of language and narrative uh, like the war narrative to a, di a different kind of multi stakeholder multi layered uh, complex real complex systems uh, thinking and response as well and that is not so easy to come by um the the the, the remarks you make about the uncertainties um uh, and and the roles of experts experts and leadership um and and you know what what is the difference between looking at knowledge uh, different kinds of knowledges and and leadership uh, and the confusion that that often exists there so with all this kind of experts this and that uh, that we see around us now i think they're all very vital vital uh, comments and reflections and we'll we'll come back to them definitely in uh, in our conversation uh, but before we move to everybody else and uh, and these general themes that have been unearthed so far, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Mahal Rabat. Um, she is also a former Minister of Health and Population. We we have high level policy people in this uh, webinar. We're very grateful. Um, she is uh, is the former Minister of Health and Population uh, of Egypt. Um, she's executive director of the Middle East and North Africa Health Policy Forum and a professor of public health at the University of Cairo. Um, she has been appointed as a special envoy to, by the director general of the WHO to the COVID-19 uh, for the East Mediterranean region and has held numerous uh, political, academic and leadership positions in her long career uh, over three decades. Um, I have had the privilege to talk to her a few times in the, in preparation to this webinar and what struck me is that she's also a huge activist uh, which i kind of like uh, so her work in all these official uh, rooms has not made her uh, not very much on the ground as well in terms of uh, wanting some real change and uh, through a rich career she has has built the understanding of the global variations that actually uh, help to to make her a very strong voice in this uh, in this webinar as well. So, strong advocate for health systems and human development, Dr. El Rabat. We uh, we are happy to hear your uh, concluding comments for the speakers round. So, Thank go ahead, much. over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's really and very uh, encouraging as well. So, I would like to uh, in, in my five minutes uh, discussion to to highlight the needed adaptation to the new governance for health as per the COVID and the post-COVID period. So um, can you hear me well? 
I can hear you very well. I hope if others uh, just raise it in the chat box if there's any sound issues, but I can hear Dr. Rabat uh, with no problem. Thank you very much. So uh, the, COVID, the COVID crisis and the pandemic, the, it has unpacked the challenges uh, seen in the health systems in the response and the rapid response and in responding to the rapidly changing health needs and demands of the people and the communities and in responding to the emergencies and shocks as well. And the responsiveness is impacted by a range of factors affect from the health system and outside the health system as well. So, and at the same time, uh, and I consider this as an opportunity, this pandemic underscored our understanding of the complexity and of the interrelationships between the different types and the different determinants of health and the challenges that the countries face which hinder their adaptive ability to respond uh, to this emergency situation. And the fact that the health systems cannot on their own uh, be responsible or cannot on their own overcome or solve all of the existing challenges and the evolving health challenges. And this has become quite clear, I think, to everyone. It's not the health system alone that is responsible and can be responsible, held responsible for um, the responses that we're, we're, ha we're having or we're meeting. So the COVID crisis in a way demonstrates the need for stronger health systems that are resilient to all incidences and shocks and in providing as well the essential health services for the sake of the health security, the public health, universal health coverage. And this requires the embracement of a whole government and whole of society's approach. But here comes the question of, we always say whole of government, whole of societies. These approaches cannot be uh, embraced without acknowledging and prioritizing health and well-being as a, a vision to redefine the health systems and the sector functions and operations. So it's prioritizing health and well-being in order to be able to pass forward to the needed changes or restructuring transformational uh, actions that are needed for the health systems as a whole. So we're talking of redefining a vision based on the prioritization of people's health and well-being to redefine the sectors, the health sectors and systems, functions and operations and the mechanisms for readjusting and readapting to the evolving situations. And um, knowing that health impact consequences are not only embedded in the health system, but in actors and in sectors outside the health. And this uh, is really def definitive of the complex and the complexities of uh, the health, the dynamic complexities of the health in a way. So now governments are in the phase or are now transitioning from the crisis management to the recovery management. And in order to foster responsive and resilient health systems, we need to restructure the health systems and the functions as we see needed with a visionary, uh, a predictive, anticipatory, visionary response that would impact the whole uh, responsiveness of the system, how we see it going into the future. So we have to acknowledge that there is no going back to the business as usual. So how can we utilize ways, new ways, innovative ways of analysis, thinking, communicating, governing, leading, to reshape and rebuild our future health systems and its governing structures. And knowing that health and well-being and health is a top priority uh, development uh, issue. So we have health and we have the econo economy and they are both two faces of one coin. Now they are inseparable. And this is the new way of thinking of how to address health in the coming uh, period. So what, what governments must do, they should act rapidly now both to assess the effectiveness of the health system, but as well to forecast and to see how they want to move forward in order to respond uh, to and to promote and protecting the health of and well-being. So what is needed, and, and I think, and this is the opportunity, uh, the COVID has given governments this opportunity, is to promote the integrated and collaborative actions within the health system and outside the health sector, with stakeholders, with different actors, with communities. So we want to have a shared new vision 
revisiting policies, regulations, and to, to restructure or to set a new governance arrangements that supports the coherence and flexibility between the different actors. And I think this is really very important. And this would require, I would think, um, generating new roles and responsibilities, transforming to more flexible, adaptable operations, uh, uh, attacking or addressing the different challenges that were seen in the, in, uh, during the response, the procurement, the repurposing, the, the production, the informal workers, the social context, all of this, they have to be seen in a more comprehensive way. So uh, we need to ask ourselves what uh, is this governance arrangement and how the governance structures have to be organized around a number of actors, both within the state, outside the state, through a synergistic set of adaptive policies that incorporates and that engages people, communities, societies as um, as, as, as an arm, uh, as um, an energetic arm in this uh, response. So we have to emphasize this role as a defining factor. So I think that at this point, what we need is a commitment to change towards a fit for purpose and adaptive governance arrangements that would lead to the future needed transformation in the health sector and the health uh, response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rabat. Um, I, I was frantically taking notes while you were talking and um, to all the people participating, um, we now start the, the rest of the conversation. So we have an hour and 15 minutes. We can go to an hour and a half. So that means that we have a good half hour, 40 minutes to talk amongst each other about uh, the various things that have been, uh, been, have been communicated so far and shared so far. But to start with Dr. Rabat, uh, of course, a lot of people that participate in this conversation probably also know that uh, even before COVID, there were lots of flaws in the ways health systems or social systems operate. It's, it's part of our human predicament. Um, we have made diagnoses about a lot of things, uh, even without COVID. Uh, in, I've, I've said in one of the other webinars that it sometimes even seems that none of what the things we now see are new. Uh, but they're all now all together. All of a sudden, uh, everything comes together. Um, so some of the things that you said that there is acknowledgement uh, of, of fragmentation or there's acknowledgement of certain things in the system that are dysfunctional. Uh, there is an awareness that we should somehow now organize to, to get beyond that. Uh, these things, even before COVID, a lot of, of the same uh, desires have been expressed. Now, you have been in the role of a minister. If I would now put you back in that role for, for a second. Um, a lot of what you say, I think, are, are things that should be done indeed. But it's so much at the same time. And we see that so many people are thrown back to uh, basic self-preservation, institutional self-preservation, individual self-preservation. So where, is, where would you start, if you were now the minister, where would you start to say, okay, let's seize the moment and let's do some of the things that you said we should do, because we know it's hard work. It's easy to say, let's have multi-stakeholder uh, coalitions and collaborations. But of course, in reality, we all know this is quite complicated. So you're the minister now in Egypt for a second. Um, on your own advice, what, where, would you, where would you begin to, to improve, according to the lines you just told us? Uh, first thing, I would argue the importance of health as a priority in all government's action, with the financing, with the budgeting, with the planning, with, with, with everything. So health has to be a top priority in the government's vision and mission towards improvement and development. Saying this, all the required changes, they have to be uh, managed in a way that would really encompass the health needs, the, the, the innovations, the needs of the people to satisfy the needs, to satisfy, uh, to, to bring about satisfaction, to support the universal health coverage, and at the same time to support the health security, to invest in the public health measures 
to invest in health workforce and to invest in all of uh, the aspects that are really challenging the response of uh, the health system. We need to be more prepared. We need to be more inclusive of all of the needs and the demands in a way that would really uh, cover everyone in the population and in a way that would protect their health and their life and to promote their health in the way. This will never happen unless a shared vision uh, is there between uh, the different actors in the government, the different actors in the, with different stakeholders of uh, how to bring health as a top priority at the forefront for all uh, development activities and to take it forward from there given the independence and given the stewardship needs of uh, whoever is in place to support the restructuring and the reorganization of the health system with partnerships, strong partnerships with the different stakeholders to bring in a comprehensive framework of actions uh, given as well, of course, as we know, uh, limited resources, maybe uh, in inadequate allocations, but as much as possible, how to enlarge on what is there in order to bring out about the needed uh, support. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of richness in the answer as well. Uh, with one, I am I'm at the same time looking at uh, the questions that are coming in, and uh, there's quite a lot. Uh, there's one, I, I just take a few comments and questions and then go back to the speakers, if that's okay with you. Um, I see comments that are related to what I just asked Dr. El Rabat, so basically, what would be the first step? Um, so all the speakers maybe give a little bit of thought to that. What would be your first step if, if you had to sort of advance this agenda of more adaptive health systems? Then I see comments also coming from Prashant and others who say there have been remarks made about uh, adaptivity cannot mean that we have one power cluster being replaced by another power cluster and that pre-existing power structures are just, you know, rehushing themselves. Um, so that nothing in the end really changes. So, so how do we get beyond uh, the frameworks? Um, and, and some people, of course, in the governance arena are very experienced to, uh, to self-preserve, uh, to, to make their own uh, agenda uh, prevail, whatever the situation. Um, so how do we get away from, from these pre-existing frameworks that, that pre prohibit? Uh, some real change. So let, let's start with these two uh, and then I'll come to several other speakers like Naima and other uh, participants who have raised issues. But let's start with what would be your first entry point for change and how do we prohibit or how do we prevent um, to fall into similar sort of exclusionary mechanisms um, and, and make this adaptation agenda uh, really much more inclusive than they have been before. I would like to start with Dr. Dairitz on these two questions, whatever you want to uh, pick from them. Thank you, Godwin. Well, I've been asked that question so many times. What would you do if you were minister again? You know, I, I have several answers to that, but uh, my training as an epidemiologist actually goes into uh, command and control. You know, when you're, when you're thinking about uh, just getting the job done epidemiologically. Sorry, my phone's ringing, so. Just getting the job done epidemiologically. And so you focus. It's like a command operation and you just get the job done. And that's essentially what we were able to do with SARS. Department of Health was able to respond quickly and we're able to contain the virus before it spread. But COVID-19 is a very different uh, enemy. And now, if I were minister as a first step, I would really focus on uh, integrating the approach throughout the whole public sector in collaboration with strong private sector support. And when I say that, I mean, I'm talking about large bureaucracies that usually work in silos. 
I would, I would insist that they plan together, that they work together. For example, whatever health is doing, if social welfare has to do social amelioration, if the Department of Transportation needs to do any intervention of public transport and everything, they have to be planning together and see the implications of all their, their moves. Because usually what they do is they put themselves. I would insist on that. And then I'd have that group who work with private sector because private sector is more mobile. The experience here is that in public sector, you trip over yourselves with old uh, regulations and laws and say, we can't do it because there's this law. I'd say you'd have to break down those silos and many of those policies that prevent you from actually working effectively. So I would focus on that. And as I did that, I would have also to ensure that I was communicating what we were doing effectively to the population. Risk communication, for them to really understand the nature of the threat. Because if they don't understand the nature of the threat, you know, they're not going to cooperate. So essentially, it's from my perspective now, it's mobilizing the machinery of public sector complemented by private sector. And uh, I hear what uh, I think uh, Jean Benoit was saying, you know, that the uh, private sector is not part of the, you know, they're involved, but they're not really part of the governance process. They need part of the governance process. It's a mixed system. Therefore, 50% of our system is private. It, it's, it's not possible not to include them. So that's what I would do. Okay, integrate that whole response, public private, and then risk communication for the population. Those would be my first steps. Okay, Th thank you very much. I want to go over to Prashant because he's been very actively commenting on uh, this, this, the second part of this, this uh, question, which is to do with how do we prevent uh, the same mechanisms to, to take over again. And so he, he takes it quite fundamentally to the level of who is the we in, in all this speaking about we should do this, we should do that. Uh, so Prashant, it's, uh, it's over to you. Maybe you can pull a few of the, the questions you were replying to as well into your, uh, into your intervention. Over to you. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, I don't believe this is a, a kind of a, an answer, but uh, just an offering to this, uh, to this uh, conversation. Um, I, I just feel that um, that uh, uh, by nature of uh, uh, the question, some of us are able to engage in more abstract uh, notions um, given our circumstances. So um, the more and more abstract a notion becomes, the more and more academia engages with it. But at the heart of this conversation is not academia. It's, it's actually daily lives. Uh, and circumstances of uh, people. And those people, by the design of the way we do this itself, cannot because the, you know, the circumstances uh, do not allow. So, and the only way I can see how uh, the conversation itself about change can become more inclusive is if we move away from a framework that, uh, that, uh, that, that prioritizes experts and committees and you know, reports to a framework that pushes down such platforms of action and conversation to the lowest level. And this is, of course, not new. I mean, uh, in India, we have a vibrant uh, movement of uh, what, what's called in my place as a panchayat system, a local government. And I think I know the Philippines has a, a very strong local government. Many other countries have. But as boring as it may sound, <laughs> we need to get those uh, systems uh, working, I think, if more people have to join this uh, Thanks a million and I think this is one of the follow-ups of our webinars because not only in this webinar but in, in most of, of the, the other conversations as well as, as a collaborative and as participating networks of course we, we are very aware of where we find ourselves in the world 
and and uh, it's it's extremely important to to broaden conversations and and maybe even move away from webinars and move to other spaces that's that's for sure uh, and how to do that in a way that is productive and it in the end also ends up in in doing something better for people um, that I think is a long discussion, but I think we should engage in that. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you brought that up. I saw Jean Benoit nodding a few times emphatically, <laughs> emphatically. so uh, a little uh, reply from you and then I'll go to the next few rounds of questions because I see many people uh, in the chat box. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure I have uh, much, much to add, but the reason I was nodding, I was uh, agreeing with most of what, what was said. Um, to me, there is a question about what, what is visible and what becomes visible, and do we have the systems in place to know that people are excluded, to know who is excluded? And uh, so there's this, I mean, there's partly a question of obviously power grabbing and, 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 and things like that. There's also sometimes a simple problem of information. Uh, do who make decisions, um, how do they know, how do they have full um, information? Obviously, you can decentralize the, uh, through making process, and I think uh, Panchayat is, 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 is one of the systems that can work, health facility committees, and, 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 and all the sort of social um, accountability we uh, mechanism we know of. But there is also a question of, of what's going on at, uh, at the national level. And what I'm really slightly worried about is when I see the composition of some of the COVID-19 task forces that are not giving themselves the, the option to um, to know what they don't know because of the way they are built. There, there, will be, there will be blind to some issues simply because of the very narrow membership they have. I think this is a vital thing for all of us to reflect because I, I can see from the names participating in this webinar that a lot of people are very active uh, on different fronts. And I think we're all confronted with this. There are, there are the usual suspects in many, many settings um, and we might be part of them. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's vital that we talk about how, how are things opening up and not that we are the ones opening up, but that there's different interrelations uh, developed. Now on that point uh, and the slowness of that process, uh, I also saw that Naima uh, al Ghazia uh, posed a question earlier. Maybe Naima, you can raise uh, your issue yourself. Um, I always like to hear your voice. So Benjamin, if she can be uh, unmuted or you can unmute yourself. <laughs> Naima, can we yeah. hear you? Yes, uh, I have raised several, but I want to focus on three points. Thank, thanks to all the speakers. Very, very critical messages. One key message that is thread uh, across all is the engagement and the involvement of the voices, the voices that can bring a change. That's the way I heard it. The second message is when uh, talking about the change and revisit, how much we can bring within the governance uh, to have the thread of the health in all policies. And in terms that it's not just one ministry, I'm not talking about health as a sickness, but health as a well-being that was stated in your uh, previous, uh, at, at the outset. And the final uh, message is that under the governance, it, are we going to look more and more that we should not have a minister in the cabinet that is equal, but a higher? And already it was addressed by the speakers that with COVID-19, immediately the governance was changed and it went to the presidents or to the prime minister or to a different lead. It could be another ministry. So it's not the weakest, it's the way they have looked at the health security angle that was raised, but also the economy and development. So these are some of the questions that I have raised in different components. That no economy, no development, no well-being if we have six people. So that's the change of mindset. My final uh, call and advocacy, everybody has heard me, we need to be at the local level and bring the community at the heart. The question of who is the community, the, even we can take it at the smallest cell of the villages. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And thanks to this thought provoking messages. Well, thanks Naima also for your intervention, short, sharp and to the point as usual. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, 
that, uh, you. that you could uh, could join this conversation because we know how passionate also you are where you stand uh, on some of these uh, these key issues that you raise um, I'm, I'm just scrolling quickly because I saw several other um, remarks uh, one hand was raised by now I need to help have Benjamin help me uh, Muna Muna Khalif Ali she raised or her hand or he raised his hand I'm sorry if I'm gender blind here uh, Muna are you still here Muna Khalifa somebody needs to unmute Muna Khalifa or if not maybe gone for tea or coffee uh, then I'd like to also move to, to Mary Hadley. Mary, maybe because you, you raised several issues in the chat box, maybe you can uh, quickly capture them yourself. So over to Mary Hadley. Mary. Mary, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, good afternoon. Yeah. Um, sorry, you caught me on the spot. <laughs> um, yes, so I, I, I agree very much with with everything that's being said. And, and it's back to your same question, Holly. What, what's the first step? Somebody has got to take the first step. And, and who is that? And what's going to persuade them to take the first step? So if we take the example of Kenya, recently there was a criticism of the Lancet laboratories. Well, um, they provide a very good service and they could be helping with the testing in Kenya, which is, should be one of the priorities at the moment. But if the, if the Minister of Health is, is publicly denouncing them as, as an organization that's not providing good service, um, how, how, how do we build a trust? How do we change that to allow the private sector to be properly regulated, but uh, and, and become part of the health sector. We talk about health sector and, and so many countries think of that as the public sector that does not include the private sector and CSOs. Um, but but how, do we, how do we change that? It's going to be slow. It's not going to happen overnight, but we can take the great opportunity perhaps with the COVID to spearhead and really move things forward that otherwise would take years and decades and, and may, may never even happen. I think that was my point. Uh, can I just follow up with, because this is conversational this webinar, can I just follow up with what you just said because I think it's it underpins a lot of the other questions as well. We, we see the overwhelming nature and the in, interdependent nature of, of a lot of the observations that everybody's making. And then it's, it's so much that people feel maybe a little overwhelmed to say, you know, where, where to start indeed, where to begin. Um, when I said first step, I don't mean there is one solid only first step. I think there's a lot of uh, collective first steps, which together build a picture, I guess. Um, and so the steps might be in, in shifting the thinking. Uh, some of us are really thinkers or academics or people who like to, to conceptualize and, and like to move concepts into the world. Now that might be a step there uh, to, to shift the language. Uh, for instance, in the last webinar, we had one speaker who uh, who introduced the words eavesdrop eavesdropping she was an ethnographer and she said you know I'm, I'm i'm trying to listen more i try to listen to language and where i find language is not appropriate i try to shift uh, help to shift the language so for instance away from military so that is one step that that person felt she could take um yeah. Others might say, well, I'm in, uh, like Dr. Dyrit, I'm very close to the policy arena, so I'll, I'll brief these guys that succeeded me uh, on maybe how to, to do more integrative policy. Or, um, so there, I think there are many steps to, to move towards something new, but I think we have to be very clear what yeah. the new is. Uh, and so maybe that is the problem, that we still have not collectively come together enough about what substantively and in terms of values we really want to go and stand for and take that first step for. Um, and so, so before maybe talking about systems and moving mechanisms, etc., maybe we should say what is important. Now, Prashant came very close to mm -hmm. saying what is important. What is important is that this is the real life of real people. 
and there is inequities that are just so brutal and have been brutally exposed again. So let's work on that. That is that is a substance towards which you want to bring change. Um, but maybe we, we we should not make life more difficult for ourselves. We just say, where do we stand? Who are we? And what is the baby step that we can take towards something that we substantively, in terms of values, find important? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, talking to you, Mary, where you based, mm -hmm. uh, what would be your step, first step, from where you stand? Hmm, good question. Um, I, I think it is, as you say, it's getting everybody, getting many different players on the same page and working together towards something. I think that that is probably the most um, productive um, step that I could take network network and 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 have people moving in the same direction and that means from every from so many levels and from so many different angles it, when we if we're using the example of of uh, of of the, the private sector in Kenya for example as an example where do do we want to go with that um, and who can say what and who can do what towards that. And so there are so many voices, including the media, of course, it's very important in Kenya. It's very important and very well trusted and very open. So it, I think it will be getting a collective um, body to move forward for the same. Okay, but that's already, that's not a baby step. That's already a huge one uh, to, to really get a collective movement. Because yeah. I, well, while I'm listening to <laughs> interventions, not just in this webinar, but also in others, um, our heads can think very big. We can think a lot of worlds and complexity. Uh, and if, if we devote time to it, we can do even more. But our baby steps, our steps of what we practically can move in our real existences, of course, are smaller than all the things we can think up. Um, so and I think that that is what COVID also confronts us with, that you know, we might have fantastic ideas, and maybe already for decades, on how to change things, but our change capacity is limited, um, and we have also limited talents, all of us. So what do we do? Uh, to still create that critical mass and address all these beautiful uh, with the baby steps we can take. I see that uh, uh, Dr. Rabat wants to come in. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, it's really very intriguing to see all this uh, discussion points, you know what I mean? So it's like we are in a situation now, there is a momentum and there is a force and energy and a dynamic process that is taking place national, regional, and global, it has to be captured in a way to identify our bottlenecks, our challenges, and to work on those challenges in a very, in a very, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, how to say, you know what I mean, like starting, I don't want to say the usual words, the slow, ha the uh, hanging fruits, and, 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 but we need to have this strategic thinking thinking, I'm not talking about strategies. It is the thinking of how to grasp this moment, this opportunity to work on the successes that are there on the ground, to pave the way for more changes to come collectively with the different stakeholders. And I really, uh, I really like the, I, the conceptualization of the contexts uh, of uh, the work or actions. How can we contextualize whatever needs to be done given the, the, the variance in the, uh, in the power, in the strength, in, 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 and the role of the communities, you know, as uh, partners in what is real being done. But I mean, what, we, what we're seeking is not a total transformation. We're not just exploding everything, but we're building on a situation. We're building on the strength. And this is the momentum that should be grasped by everyone. We need a thinking strategic thinking, how do we see ourselves, how do we use our resources, and how at the same time, how can we collaboratively and cohesively 
make forward our path to a more resilient health system. And this, I think, is a way of thinking and it needs all the actors on the ground to come hand in hand, to have to think forward how we can move and organize all of our efforts. It's not like we're turning pages around. It's not, we cannot do it that way, but we're taking it forward in a more uh, strategic way that could be implemented. Yeah, and we're not talking of things that are not feasible on the ground, but we have to be very realistic, but to grasp this opportunity, build on the successes and see we need to learn from the experiences as well. Yeah, and we are not alone in this, in, in, in this emergency or outbreak. We need to learn of things that work in other contexts in similar context and how we can grasp all of this opportunity and information to build our vision, new vision for a transformation to a more uh, resilient health system, adaptive to situations and adaptive and flexible to the increasing needs of people's uh, needs and demands and their well-being as well. And I think that uh, the sustainable development goals is an opportunity to embed all the changes that are needed in the health sector and the health sector and the governance issue because this is as well another platform which is really pushing uh, the, the changes that are needed in the health system as well on the health sector. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because of course many people in different parts of the world are currently uh, breaking their heads on, on the same. So it, it, it is indeed also a question of connecting, connecting, connecting. Um, I see in the questions earlier on, uh, Mr. Abdurrahman el uh, can he be unmuted? Uh, because he had a point to raise and I want to give him the floor for a minute. We have, uh, we go on till about 20 past, if that's okay with all of you. Uh, we have in principle uh, till quarter past, but we have a, a possibility of allowing a few more minutes. So let's let's go till 20 past uh, two CET so that people know what is still ahead is nine minutes from now. Uh, but Mr. Abdurrahman, are you there? Or has he left us? You have to unmute yourself probably. I'm asking Benjamin maybe to check. If the microphone is working, Mr. Abdurrahman El Wishahi. Wishahi. El Wishahi. 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 Excuse me. It's time I take Arabic. <laughs> I'll come to Cairo for a course if travel allows. Uh, Hopefully, you can. Anyway, he's probably just left us. That's, that is a pity, but. Um, then I would like to move to, to Hala. Hala, if you're still with us, Hala, Hala Abu Talib, because I saw several interventions from your side. Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Um, good uh, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well, thank you. Yes, uh, I would like first to uh, join, uh, join you all in thanking the panelists. I really enjoyed the discussion and even the, the ones in the chat box that you could, the ones you shared and the others. I just wanted to uh, add a few things that, uh, adding to what uh, Dr. Rabat mentioned and others, is that we're talking about a phased approach, um, opportunistic, being opportunistic at the country level to identify and diagnose where are the bottlenecks or the weak chains in the system design to make it work together. We've been hearing from uh, the, 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 that during an emergency, we find that the military or the heads of states are stepping in to uh, take over because there, there needs to be a steward or a coordinator or a head for the response. The problem is the health systems, we assume that the ministries of health are the ones who are leading in normal situations and even in the main, uh, in the emergencies, which is not the case. They don't have the capacities or the authority to do that. And uh, that, that's why it's very important, as I uh, shared with you all in the, uh, um, in the box, uh, that I'm not talking about the institu an institution who should be leading. I'm talking about the functions, how we make sure that uh, this is a, 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 a one of the points I think we should, st the governments could, could start, or the states should start, to see where are the stewardship uh, functions 
public health functions and roles and responsibilities. Where are they being there? Who is the, they need to delegate this responsibility to, along with the resources to make sure that um, in an environment where this whole uh, allows for whole government and whole society approach that the, the, uh, those actors could be held accountable. Of course, ha you know, this will require to have a vision where are the where the country wants to move ahead and to set uh, targets uh, towards that. Second, I wanted to raise an, uh, the issue that COVID-19 brought a very important governance challenge, a global governance challenge. Who is going, we, we've been talking about vaccinations, uh, treatments, rapid tests, technologies, and those, um, who's gonna be, the, which countries are going to have access to those once they are um, 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 uh, um, available? Who and within the countries, who is going to be able to uh, have access to them? So accessibility and the right to health and making sure that the, the inequal inequities between countries are not there. There's a, this requires a bigger picture, as I like Dr. Sarkat always mentioned, that we need to talk about the global health governance. It's not only within, because this is going to have a huge implication on the health system governance at the national level. So I just wanted to raise and share with you those issues and challenges and make sure again to, that this is an opportunity. There's a lot of demand and um, open ears and eyes for change. We need to uh, seize it and grasp the opportunity to move ahead with the change. Over to you, Gudri. Uh, Thanks very much, Hala. And I think it's, it's, it links very nicely what you just said. Um, to a much wider discussion that again, we will also with the Health Systems Governance Collaborative will carry out. We, we focus this debate so far very much on the national level because a lot of the operations have of course been at national level, but um, we are working in a global arena where um, not under the same sort of governance regimes, all kinds of decisions are being taken that impact on, on nations and that impact on, on local communities as well. Uh, and the governance structures there are not similar. So I think that's, that's another uh, element to, or a big dimension to this discussion. What is the global governance gonna amount to um, and how adaptive and, and also how accountable uh, are we actually uh, uh, globally? Uh, and I think that, that could fill a whole separate conversation. I'm gonna take finally a few points in the Q&A and I'm also gonna read um, what Abdulrahman posted to us, even if he's not there himself anymore, but he said something very important about the first steps. He said one first step should have been the wide acknowledgement that our national systems with their narrow-sided limited memberships are not adequate to respond to the current health crisis. This acknowledgement would then have to be followed by engaging stakeholders to establish national, regional, public-private partnerships to be able to efficiently mobilize all resources to address the current pandemic in a much sort of broader fashion. And I think that was a very valuable um, uh, contribution, I think, to, uh, to our exchanges. In the Q&A, there are a few questions. Um, so from Dr. Syed Masoud Ahmed, who is actually uh, in, uh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, how health, system, uh, how health systems can be adapted to overcome the continued and alarming health sector corruption uh, in the days of COVID. Um, and he says in low middle income countries, but I assume this is actually fairly global. So how can we do that? Uh, and then a contribution from Tirta Kumar Sina. I think we need a plan to plan TA to local and provincial governments to have a role of implementation, who have a role in implementation in Nepal, where I assume uh, Tirta, Tirta is based. Now health is priority at all levels, uh, but a lot of capacity is still, uh, is still lacking. And then finally from Venkat, um, Venkatesh uh, Padukuran Ganath, I'm sorry if I muddle your name, uh, apologies, how to make uh, adaptivity possible at grassroots level. Uh, so this all links to, well, who are actually in this adaptivity discussion? Who are speakers? Who are voices? Who are agents uh, in it all? Um, these are large questions, I think, to, to end with. But I want to do a final round of longer panelists uh, with, with two things in mind. Specifics that you still want to address, but very briefly, because we promised we would keep our time. And secondly, your, your main take-home message yourself or uh, advice to, to all of us 
of what we should take up first, because I think this, this has been exploring a very rich arena of adaptivity. And of course, we do not have the final uh, answers right here, but we've, we've raised, I think, some very vital uh, considerations. So I start uh, the other way around now. This time I start with Maha and I end with, uh, with Dr. Dairitz, so the reversed order of the speakers. Uh, but uh, Maha and short, brief, because we have about a couple of minutes left. So it's really 30 so, seconds. So it is uh, our commitment to the change, our commitment to build the resilient health systems and to change towards a fit for purpose governments arrangements that allow for the coherence, good cohesiveness to uh, flexibility and adaptive, adaptive to be adaptive to the needs and the demands uh, to, of the newer vision that we hope we can uh, put forward into our uh, systems, health systems and government systems. So it's the commitment. Okay. And from there we start. Thank you very I much. I think this is a very nice keyword. Uh, similar, short and sharp. Uh, I now go to uh, Prashant. I think I uh, echo my earlier thing of uh, probably a humble expert who co-creates solutions rather than uh, bring answers uh, and co-creates it at as low a level as possible and certainly not uh, global health. Okay, great. Um, I would love to have a little tile with that text on it <laughs> to bring to certain places. But anyway, uh, we can uh, have some young artists work on that one. Uh, thank you very much, Prashant. I think, you know, very serious, of course, very serious remark. Co-create, humble experts. I think this is, is hugely important. Jean Benoit. Um, yes, home. I will, rem I will remember um, this idea actually of moving away from health care systems to health systems. And I really am much proud of you. And I think this is really what I've, I've learned from this one, but also from all the other webinars, this idea that everybody now realizes this is just much bigger than just healthcare in the sense of, you know, the public health system. And then the lingering question of trust, uh, it's, 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 it's everywhere in the chat. Uh, it's a really hard question. Uh, and I think we need to be a lot more serious about, about, about trust. Um, yeah. Um. I get a bit silent because that is that is indeed one of the deeper ones, uh, and and we see the, the 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 contrast to trust everywhere, yeah? and and it's it's how to how do you build that? That I think is very local, local building up again. I think we need to really do very grounded local work uh, to to face all this. Uh, so thanks for thanks for that take home message, Manuel. Uh, the final I think words. I'd like to I think I'd like to end with the idea of uh, capacity of local government, particular capacity of local government, particularly vis-a-vis -vis their own constituencies. Up the lot of national government, but in the end, it's it's local government and how they, they they are able to capacitate even their communities. I think which is going to make a difference, and. Uh, Building capacity in local government is not easy. It takes a while. And we decentralized in 1992. So we're seeing the fruits of it now. You know, some of the local governments are, are really much better, but uh, it's still very uneven. And I think local governments plays a major role, even as national our government uh, makes policy. Thank you so much. And I think you tie nicely to, to Maha's commitment because this is another thing you brought in your message, the, the time frame. Um, we, we have grown up in a time of quick fixes, easy solutions, everything has to be ready by tomorrow. Whereas we're now talking about things that really, really, really take time and commitment. So um, on that note, and with, with a huge uh, word of thanks to all our speakers and to everybody uh, who has been speaking in the chat box and in, uh, in uh, the conversation. Thank you very much for being present at this uh, fifth uh, Building the Reset webinar. Like Benjamin said uh, in the beginning, uh, the link to this webinar as well will appear on our website in a couple of days uh, with a little summary and all the other website, uh, webinars you can find there as well. And it, it might be worth your while to, to take a moment and look at the whole uh, setup of Conversations 5 now where I think we've, we've rolled around uh, this, this, this core set of transformational questions. 
and uh, this is definitely not the last time we will talk to each other with each other so i hope everybody uh, will stay safe uh, will stay okay uh, and we'll meet again soon i hope uh, online or otherwise um, and i wish everybody a very good afternoon evening and thanks to the speakers again and hope to see you bye <laughs>